right, good evening, everybody. How is everybody tonight? Y'all doing good? It's good to see you. Hey, Pastor, how you doing, Pastor? Don't forget your microphone's up here in the front. All right, well, y'all have me by myself tonight. Oh, Lord Jesus, okay. All right, let's all stand tonight, and we'll go to the Lord with worship and praise. Well, now Moses led God's children. Forty years he led them through the cold and through the night. Well, now though they said, let's turn back. Moses said, keep going. Canaan's land is just inside. There will be no sorrow there in that tomorrow. We will be there by and by Where milk and honey flowing There is where I'm going Canaan land is just inside And though we walk through valleys Though we climb high mountains, we must not give up the fight. For we must be like Moses. We must keep on going. And Canaan's land is just inside. Now there will be no sorrow there in that tomorrow we will be there by and by where milk and honey flowing there is where i'm going canaan land is just inside now there will be no sorrow there in that tomorrow we will be there by and by where now milk and honey flowing there is where i'm going canaan land is just inside now canaan land is just in well, I feel the touch of hands so kind and tender well, they're leading me in paths that i must trot and i'll have no fear when jesus walks beside me now for i'm sheltered in the arms of god so let the storms rage high the dark clouds rise they won't worry me for i am sheltered safe within For I am shell 
think our singer and musicians tonight before you're seated turn around and look at somebody tell them you love them glad to see them welcome them to the house of God tonight glad you're here for those of you watching at home tonight we miss you we love you we understand why you can't be here we pray you can be with us very soon and uh, if you're watching online from some other city or state. Next time you're down our way, you come and visit with us. We'd be honored to have you here at Osceola Church of God. This is our adult Bible study. Our youth are next door meeting and kids are meeting next door and upstairs and all over the campus. And it's a great church and we'd be honored to have you. And for those of you who are in the building with us tonight, this is your first time with us. Uh, we honor you. We bless you. Try to shake our hand before you leave tonight and head out. Um, Brother Mark is not here tonight because he was under the weather. Tommy and Tommy, uh, they had an event uh, Mark, he's already been tested and, and is negative, but I know there are other people. We won't name names tonight because we'll be here all night, all around us in our community, people who need a touch from God in their body. Our hospitals are full again. We still uh, hear people who are in desperate need, ventilators, the whole nine ICU units, um, ECMO machines. The list goes on and on and on. So we want to keep to continue to pray. And if you all remember when we went through this the first go-round of last year, 
We also want to make sure that we're very careful to pray for our nurses, our doctors, our EMTs, those folks who are on the front lines, people in nursing homes and all that. Well, don't forget about them because here they go again with being overworked, the challenges, the, the long hours. So let's continue to pray for them and for our community. And uh, we thank God for his blessings on us. And we'll continue to avail ourselves of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and uh, lead, be led by him in every decision we make here for how we do things. And um, So let's just continue to pray. Again, the list of names tonight, way too long, but we're going to pause in just a moment and pray for uh, people in our community. And if you know one by name, you call them by name there where you sit. And uh, in the meanwhile, we're going to continue to worship the Lord tonight with our giving. God has been good to us. God has been good to us, and he's blessed us, and is blessing our church and blessing our families. And uh, one way that we honor him and worship him is with our giving. So we're going to pray real quick tonight. And... Um, at the end of service, as you're leaving, you can give, and uh, people are giving online. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. I, I'll say it this way. There was a certain amount that I believe God for every week. And Nadine says, you're going to drive yourself crazy looking at this thing weekly. We should really look at it monthly because some people get paid monthly. And, but anyway, I've been looking at a certain amount each week. And uh, last week, I said, Lord, you know, we were off about 1,000. I was hoping for 1,000, but that was the amount I've been believing for. And all day that day, buying school clothes for the kids and eating and all this stuff, I was thinking about that 1,000. Lord, you know, we really need this now. We've hired on somebody else, and we're just believing God. We want to continue to do things in our church, and we want to have programs, and we don't want to be, you know, what? That evening on the way back, Sister Eason texted and said, Oh, I meant to tell you online there was $3,000 that came in online, and I meant to tell you about that. And, and uh, God looked at me and said, Now, see there, all day today, you've been worried over 1000 And there was 3000 sitting there the whole time. This past Sunday, we made that 1000 again and more. And God continues to bless us. And we only tell that to say, if God would do it for his church, God would do it for his church. God will do it for his church. So what we have to do is learn to say, I'm going to put my trust in you. And God, when I can't see it, yet I believe. I believe. So Jesus, tonight I thank you, Lord, for those men and women who right now they can't see their healing. They can't see their diagnosis. And for some, it's not COVID. There's other things going on in bodies tonight. For those who can't see it. For those, Lord, who can't see a way of escape out of a situation in their family, in their home. Those who can't see the breakthrough. Those who can't see the miracle. I pray even now, Lord, tonight there'll be a peace that comes and rests upon us in knowing that though we may not be able to see it, already you have provided. Lord, we thank you for blessing your people. Thank you, Lord, for blessing your church. Thank you, God, for blessing every man and woman, every family represented, every business represented. Every company represented for the economy of this community and for South Georgia. Lord, we don't know what the days ahead might look like, but we know, God, that you are our provider and you're our source. And that, Lord, we'll keep our eyes fixed on you. And even if we don't see it, we rejoice in knowing that you will take care of your people. Uh, I've been young and I've been old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. Thank you, Lord. We're going to be fed. We're going to be clothed. We're going to be provided for because you're our God. You're our king. You're our father. And it's in the name of your precious son that we pray in Jesus name. Everybody said amen and amen and amen. So you guys continue to pray for those right now tonight. Uh, David Tucker came home today. He came home after being in the hospital. Pneumonia. COVID pneumonia, uh, back home, he's still dealing with oxygen. Um, who's another one? Who's in a, oh, so we're going to skip some names on some other ones. I'm sorry, we are not going to do names. So uh, just continue to pray for people in the body of Christ and in our community here, and um, we're going to look for God to do great things. Everybody said amen. All right, do you have your Bible? We're coming down to the wire, Proverbs 29 and Proverbs 30. Next week, next Wednesday, the last one, Proverbs chapter 31. And uh, that'll finish the book of Proverbs. And unless God leads us somehow different, I think where we're going to go from here is the Gospel of John. So I think right now, now that could change in the next two, two minutes. But as of right now, we're feeling this leaning and this compulsion to start going through the Gospel of John. So on Wednesday nights, how, how many chapters is in the Gospel of John? Let's see how long this is going to take us. 31, what is it? 
She said it don't matter. We want to finish it before Jesus comes back. John 21. So 21 chapters. So that will only take us a couple years, and we'll be finished with that on Wednesday night. So that will be good. If you want to get a jump start on this, you can go ahead and start reading in the Gospel of John. There's a movie called The Gospel of John. And as a matter of fact, whoever made the movie, they made it verbatim, word for word, the book of John. So that's a great uh, resource if you say, I'd like to just sit and watch, just to bring it to life. So you can kind of prepare your hearts and we'll see how the Lord leads us. But in the meanwhile, Proverbs 29 and Proverbs 30 tonight. i got to move quick so we can get through this, but it's going to be good. Lord, bless your word tonight. We honor it. We thank you, God, that not one word more or one word less will leave my mouth tonight than that that the Holy Spirit would have me to say. In Jesus' name. Proverbs 29 verse 1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Probably two days before we started getting ready for this lesson, I read uh, an article, popped up on my phone, these little headlines. I read an article and it was really talking about ADHD and ADD and I'll get to that in just a minute. But, but it was talking about something called rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Dr. Bowles is laughing. So uh, apparently children who grow up in homes where they're corrected all the time. I mean, almost to a fault where they're always getting in trouble. That, that's too loud. You should have vacuumed that way. You should have vacuumed this way. That's too long. Always getting in trouble. And they tied it together with kids who deal with ADHD or ADD, where especially in school, their teachers always said, hey, pay attention. Hey, focus. Hey, you're not listening. Hey, you're not doing this. These kids who grow up in a house where they're constantly being corrected over and over again, almost to excess, sometimes will grow up and deal with this dysphoria, this rejection sensitivity dysphoria, where they'll get married, and when a husband or a wife uh, corrects them, or a supervisor at work corrects them, they, they will have grown up being hearing that so much, getting on to them so much, that a lot of times they'll rage back at the boss, they'll rage back at the wife for absolutely no reason, or they'll just shut down. To the point where, you know, nobody can say anything to them. And anytime somebody says something to them and say, hey, maybe we could do it that way. Immediately they take it personally because they grow up with this constant, 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 constant. It's a little different than our ver verse, but the premise is the same. That if you have a servant or someone who is constantly being told, don't do that. And instead of him listening, instead of him changing his behavior... He goes back and does it again, and then the boss gets on him again, and then the boss gets on him again, and then the boss gets on him again. Eventually, he'll be like these people dealing with sensitivity dysphoria. They're going to rage back. They're going to get hard-hearted, hard neck, and not listen. The Bible talks about it this way. People having a seared conscience. Y'all look with me in Hebrews real quick. People who constantly, God's talking to us. God's telling you, Josh, don't do that. Josh, don't say that. Josh, don't do that. And if I'll ignore him, if I don't listen... I'm sorry, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Not Hebrews, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And the example I always use is Dr. Bowles, who ate spicy things Growing up, me and dad always watched her eating the peppers, eating the spicy stuff to the point. It's not so much now, but to the point where literally she could eat something that would burn your tongue. And she'd go, that ain't spicy. Ain't spicy. What she's done, she seared her tongue. Ephesians calls it something a little different. Ephesians says these people are past feeling. They're past feeling. It's Ephesians 4.19. They're past feeling. The English standard said they've become calloused. They've worn and worn and worn. And God has spoken and spoken. And they've ignored and, they, and they've become calloused. The NIV says they've lost all sensitivity. And that's a scary place for me to be. Where I can do something wrong. And that grief and that heartache that I used to feel. I don't even notice it anymore. It's a scary place to be to go to church and somebody preach the gospel and bring correction and me leave and feel absolutely no sort of um, holy repentance or godly sorrow. For That's a scary place to be. I'd read this story years and years and years ago out in the Midwest. This pastor who was preaching in this little town, they come to him and say, Pastor, we need to start us a church or build us a church. He said, that sounds great. 
till the next week, he sees them down by the river, pulling logs out of the river that are floating down the river, pulling logs out of the river, cutting the end of the log off and taking those logs and building the church with it. Back then, and sometimes they may still do it today, people who had land and had trees would cut down the trees, the timber. They would put the timber in the river after they had painted their initials on it. That timber would float down the river to a wood mill, and those people would pull the, the logs out of cut the logs up, and that man would get the money for it. The church folks was stealing another man's lumber to build their church. They're taking the lumber out of the wood, the trees are out of the river, taking the trees out of the river that belongs to another man and using it to build the church. So that Sunday, the preacher preached the message, Thou shalt not steal. And all the church members came out of church and patted him on the back. So that was good, preacher, that was good. And then they went right back out the next week and started pulling lumber out of the river again. So the next Sunday, he preached the same sermon, but this time he changed the title. This time, instead of calling it, Thou shalt not steal, he said, Thou shalt not take the trees out of the river that doesn't belong to you, cut the ends off, and use it to build a church. And you know what happened to him? They ran him out of town. True story. I don't want to be corrected. I don't want to be told I'm doing wrong. I I don't want that because it doesn't feel good. It's grievous to me to feel convicted, to lose some sleep of a night. I don't like it. I don't want that to happen. It's painful to receive correction from people. Well, that's a parent, a pastor, oh, God forbid it be your wife who wants to bring correction to you. Mm, that's painful that's the worst one of all and it's painful she says not necessarily it's painful when it comes from God I don't like it you know, the book of Micah the preachers there in, the, in Micah they're preaching they're prophesying God's going to bring judgment God's wrath is coming and some of the other preachers some of the other prophets told them y'all need to stop preaching that way Stop preaching them sermons. Stop saying all that stuff. Stop prophesying all that negative doom and gloom and doubt and unbelief. Stop it. That's not right. Look at what he says in Micah chapter 2, the second part of verse 7. God speaks and responds to that. God says, aren't my words good to those who do good? I mean, it's real simple. The reason it's grievous to me, the reason I don't like it, because I ain't doing right. Thank God again. Money, God blesses us here so we don't have to beat nobody over here. I'm going to use it as an example. Because I know this is a sensitive subject. When the preacher stands up and starts preaching about tithing. We need to tithe. We need to give. We need to be givers. Ooh, you know who gets mad about it? It's not the tithers. The tithers are sitting there shouting you down. That's right, Pastor. God will bless your socks off when you give. I'm here to testify, preacher. When you give, God has taken care of my family. God has put groceries in the, in the cupboard when we didn't have money. We had, we had no nothing. But we tithed and God bless us. It ain't the tithers that are mad. It's the ones who ain't doing right. When the preacher starts talking about missing church, it ain't the people who are there faithfully that gets mad about it. It's, they're saying, yes, we need to get in here and worship. It's the ones who aren't doing it. It's grievous to me. God says, if you're doing what's right, it ain't going to hurt. Mm. I need to do what's right. And when I miss it and when I mess up and I do something wrong, I need to understand that those sleepless nights where I'm laying there in the bed tossing and turning because oh, I wish I hadn't have said that now. Maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. Oh, God, you know what? I need to thank God that I have that conviction in me and I can't sleep of a night. Those mornings when you get up and that nausea is in your stomach and you think, I shouldn't have said that. You know what? I need to thank God that that thing is right there. When I do something or say something, watch something, say something, listen to something, that ain't right. And there's that grief that comes in my spirit. Don't regret it. Don't hate it. Don't resist it. You thank God that Jesus loves you enough that he's going to stop what he's doing to come and say, boy, stop. Stop it. Let me take you out behind the woodshed. Come on, somebody. Anybody know about the woodshed? Nobody knows about the woodshed. You know why I don't know about the woodshed? Because they didn't care nothing about taking you out the woodshed. They'll whip you wherever you stand. We ain't got time to go to a woodshed. We ain't going to hide it. We're going to whip you right here in the store. Behind the woodshed. Now, it ain't going to be private. It's going to be right there where you're standing. And everybody and God and their brothers going to be watching. We took you to the bathroom, screaming all the way. Woo! Get in the bathroom. Now Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 11. For whom the Lord loveth. Oh, y'all know this one. We've been in church long enough. For whom God loveth. Lord, thank you that on a Tuesday night when somebody has done something ugly and I'm mad and I want to call that preacher and I'm going to tell that wife and I want to say this to him that I walk in at 633 ready to bless them out because what they've been doing is wrong and before it's over with, I'm standing here praying for them. Thank you, Jesus. Don't you just want to look at God and say, just leave me alone for just a minute. 
Just leave me alone for just a minute. Let me, just let me call them. Let me text them, please. Let me text them. No, that conviction will come. Don't post that. Don't text that. Aren't you glad that God loves you enough? Come on, somebody, say yes. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And he scourges every son whom he receiveth. And if you endure the chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Verse 11. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I love that translation. It yields fruit. It yields fruit. Now go back to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29 verses 15 and 17. For the rod and reproof gives wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Verse 17. So correct your son, and he shall give you rest. Yea, he shall delight, be a delight unto your soul. Why do we do it again? Because we're mean? Because we're ugly? No, he says because we love. It's love. It's love that God corrects us. It's love that He disciplines us. He gives us that example. He tells us, speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. And that's hard to balance sometimes because sometimes we want to speak the truth without love. And sometimes we want to speak love without the truth. We better find somebody that loves us enough to speak the truth. And if it hurts, then we go home and we say, thank you, Jesus, that you love me too much to leave me in my mess. When God calls you out for that temper and that ugly attitude and them words coming out of your mouth and you feel that conviction, thank you, Jesus. God, I know you're still not finished with me yet. I messed up again. But, God, I thank you that there's still conviction left on the inside of me and that I can't sleep of a night until I make it right. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Come on, somebody. Thank God for that. He's still correcting me. He loves me. Which is, brings us to verse 21. It says, He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at length. Now this scripture is a little hard to dissect because some people say, well, what that means is if you uh, are overindulgent to your servant, eventually he'll grow up and he'll be spoiled and he'll act like your kid. On the flip side of that, if you're kind to your servant and you treat your servant like a son... When he gets older, he'll look at you like a father. When we do it in love. We say, I love you. I'm going to treat my servant like I would want to. That sounds familiar. Like I would want to be treated. I'm going to treat my servant like I would want somebody to treat my son. It's all wrapped up and tied up in love. Somebody say, in love. God wants to bring correction to us. Listen, one, th one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to receive discipline now, or we're going to have regret later. It's going to be painful discipline now, or it's going to be the pain of regret later. So let God just go ahead and discipline me now, train me now, prepare me now, so that when I'm, it's, it's why people, they get in a hurry and they get in a rush to do things. They want to rush a process. But what God's trying to do is purify in this process, get me ready in this process, because if I'm just thrust out here without being purified, I'm going to fall. And the fall here will be bigger. Go ahead and discipline me behind the woodshed now, in private now, lest I fall and regret it in public later. He loves me. He loves me. Proverbs 29, verse 2. That's what spiritual leaders are supposed to do. That's what they're supposed to do. This is a spiritual leader right here. Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. We need spiritual leaders who are righteous, who are going to speak the truth, who are going to walk in the truth, who are going to do what God's told them to do, who love us enough to correct us. That's what we need. And then they'll be rejoicing. That's why Paul tells Timothy. Go with me. Y'all know this one. If you don't have this verse underlined in your Bible or written down somewhere, will you please do this? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. If you don't have this verse somewhere written down at home in your Bible highlighted, this is one we need to hold on to because especially in the days to come, right, we're going to need to remember this. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 says, Therefore I exhort you first of all that complaints and grumblings and murmurings be made against... Threaten them. You say you want to kill them. You hope they die. And he didn't say that. 
He says, therefore, I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority. Somebody say all. All "All who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. He says, Paul says, Timothy, this is how we do this. We pray for Caesar. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our president. Dad said it, I remember as a little boy, him saying this so many times. I heard him say this up to a dozen times. He said, if we prayed for the president as much as we talked about him, we'd have a tongue-talking, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost president sitting in the White House. If we had prayed for him every time we wanted to talk about him. Listen, that's what Paul says. We need leaders who are holy and who are righteous. If we prayed for him, like Paul says, we would have, if we prayed for the principal. If we pray for the supervisor at work, if we pray for the boss, if we pray for our kids' teacher, if we pray for the coaches, I'm telling you God would do something. We need to pray for those who are in authority over us, and this is what we would have. Proverbs 29, verse 4. The king by judgment establishes the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthrows it. We need leaders who are just. If we'll pray for our leaders, pray for our pastors, pray for our Sunday school teachers, pray for our worship leaders, pray for our youth pastors. If we did those things, we would have some people who are walking in justice and upright before the Lord, living for the law. They wouldn't be bought with bribes. We wouldn't have presidents sitting in the White House who will take bribes. We wouldn't have people who are up there needing to be flattered and have somebody pat them on the back and making decisions based on polls. Polling opinions. If they say it's good, then I'll do it. If they say it's bad, I won't do it. Y'all, we better stop that mess where our country will sink real fast. Our city will sink real fast. If I'm doing things based on what people... We've seen pastors do it. We've watched ministers who when people who are business people or wealthy people come into the church, oh, brother, how are you? It's nice to see you. They'd wine them and dine them and take them on vacations and take them on trips and they'd eat with them and spend time with them and other people in the church. And it was so apparent and so obvious obvious that these are people who had money and then they knew these were big givers in the church so we're gonna really invest in them that's why when we first started pastoring i told our clerk in here too but when we first started pastoring our other church i said i don't want to know how much people give don't tell me how much people give i need to know that my leaders are tithing if you're a sunday school teacher i need to know that you're tithing if you're a worship leader i need to know that you're tithing if you're a youth pastor i need to don't stand up in my class and tell my kids that you need to be generous but you're not doing it yourself god i don't want you to die i don't want you to get struck by lightning you hypocrite i don't want you so i'm, I'm protecting you and i love you so make sure you're doing it but don't tell me how much they're tithing i don't need to know how much money because i don't want anybody to think I, they got me in their back pocket that they can control me nobody's going to hold the church hostage and i told trisha easton the same thing don't you tell me what people are giving because ain't nobody going to look at me and accuse me of being some pastor who's swayed by who who makes what money don't tell me i don't want to know i'm going to do i have to have an anchor that says i'm going to do what god says to do and if the rich person leaves the church let them leave but god will provide for us get let them get mad because they Let them go ahead and leave the church. God will still take care of us. I have to have an anchor. I can't be swayed by what people say. Look at what he says. Verse 23. He says, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Verse 25. And the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. He says, there's two things that will get you in trouble. You get a big head when people are saying good things about you. Get you in trouble. And when you're worried and they're saying bad things about you, it'll get you in trouble. I'm afraid what they're going to say about me. If I get a big head when they say good things, if I'm moved by the good things people say, then I will be destroyed when they start saying the bad things. I have to have an anchor. Doesn't matter if the boss likes me or not. Doesn't matter if my family says good things about me or not. Doesn't if my matter if my teacher pats me on the back or not. The pastor pats me on the back or not. I'm going to live with an anchor. What's going to be my anchor? When people's opinions change, when opinion polls change, what has to be the anchor? He says it. Verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, us pastors love to use the scripture when we're talking about a building that we're going to build. Got to have a good vision. Let me cast a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. Let me talk about the outreaches we're going to do. Let me, let me talk vision. Our church has vision. 
And without vision, the people, we're going to have vision for our new building program, our new outreach, our new exodus, our new whatever it is, Thursday nights, this Monday nights, all these things we're doing. Vision. Now, all those things are true, but that is not the vision that is being spoken of here in this scripture. Now, we've used it because the church does need vision, but that's not the kind of vision that's being talked about here. We've used that for years. Without vision, the people perish. Our church needs to have vision. Our church does need to have vision, but that is not what this scripture is saying. The Hebrew word here for vision in Proverbs, that word is hazon. Hazon. Here's the definition. I'm reading it to you word for word. A vision had in an ecstatic state, a night vision, an oracle, a prophecy, or some other form of divine communication. Just one place it's used in Scripture, multiple places, but just one is in Daniel. When Daniel said, I saw a vision. He's not talking about the building plan. He's not talking about buying a new church van. He's saying, I had an encounter with God. And God showed me some things. God spoke to me. And we need pastors and leaders who have vision and who have plans for the church and all that. But what we really need is for me to be able to go home. And to walk into my bedroom and have an encounter with God where God speaks to me. The anchor that's going to hold you in the revelation that the pastor has is going to be the revelation that you get. It's going to be you walking into the house saying, oh, God, speak to me. Now, Lord, you use that old boy up there on Sunday to confirm what you've already spoken to me this week. That's the way it's supposed to be. That this week you've heard from God. You had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to wait until somebody lays hands on you at church. And now I had an ecstatic experience. You can go into your house and say, God, I need a vision. I need you to speak to me. I need you to give me revelation. What do I do in this relationship? What do I do in my body? Lord, lead me in my ministry. It's not waiting on somebody else. It's saying, I need a divine ecstatic experience. You ain't got to shake. You ain't got to talk in tongues. But you can shut the door. And the Holy Spirit to you directly give you wisdom and insight and revelation that you can carry out of that prayer closet and it'll change the direction of the course of our lives. That's what I need. I need God to talk to me. Don't wait on the preacher to preach to you. You go home and say, God, give me a vision. Because it's that word from God that's going to hold me steady when people say don't do it. When people like it, when people don't like it, when they vote for it, when they don't vote for it, COVID or no COVID, what's going to hold me fast is God gave me a vision. He showed me that I'm the healed of the Lord. Here comes that old stupid symptom back in my body. But God has revealed to me a word. And I'm not going to move. I'm not going to be swayed. Loneliness is coming. Fear is coming. But I shall not be. I shall not be moved. Why? Because I've got a vision. Come on, somebody. Thank God for that. I've got a vision. The Lord's speaking to me. Say it. The Lord is speaking to me. The Lord is speaking to me. That's what's going to hold me fast. That's what I'm going to do. That's why Habakkuk says in chapter 2, verse 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run with it that readeth it. I need to hear from God. I need to make it plain. I would tell you, go home and write it down. Write it down. Just don't say, I'm going to be a better Christian this year. Bunk. You get a vision. How am I going to be a better Christian? You know what I'm going to do this year? I'm going to start to meditate on the Word at least 15 minutes a day. You know how I'm going to be a better Christian? I'm going to begin to fast. Write it down. We need to hear from God. We need his wisdom. We need his guidance. (laughs) He's the one that's going to make us wise. It's not my IQ. It's not my academia. It's not my GPA. It's not letters after my name. You know what's going to make me wise? A word from God. I need to hear from God. Which brings us to an old fella in Proverbs chapter 30 that we have never heard of before. And we'll never hear of again. It's the only place in scripture we read about old Agur. Proverbs 30 verses 1 through 3. The words of Agur, the son of Jekai... Even the prophecy, the man spaketh unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Ukal. Surely, he says. Now, this is Agur. We don't know who Agur is. But here we are all these years later talking about Agur. Agur says, I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have I the the knowledge of the holy. It's the opposite of Solomon. Agur is just a good old boy who says, I ain't got no learning. I ain't go to no Bible school. 
I didn't go to the school of the prophets. I know, but Elijah didn't teach me nothing. I'm telling you, I'm just a big old dummy. Anybody feel like that sometimes? Me too. I'm just a big old dummy. I'm the brutish man in the world. I, here I stand. Here I, I don't know nothing about the Greek near the Hebrew. I can barely read the English. I don't know what this is. The King James, these and dies and thous and dines. That don't make no sense to me. Bless the Lord. Might as well be speaking in tongues. That's why I like the Pentecostal church. I don't understand nothing anyway. I'm just a brutish man. But old Agar had some sense. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that trust him. I think old fella had some sense after all, don't you? Agar said, I ain't smart, but I know one thing. The word of God, the word of God is going to take care of me. His word is a shield around me. Agar wasn't a smart man, but he said, but I figured one thing out, fella. Ain't it good to know that when you can, you can be the biggest dummy in the world. But when you get a hold of God and his word for your life, you can look like the most intelligent person in the room. I don't know much, but I know God. Woo! And that's all I need to know. God will lead me. I don't know nothing about the economy. I've never studied economics. I don't know nothing about uh, selling and buying on stock markets and Wall Street. But I know that my God is my source and my supply. And he'll provide for me. I'll be like Jed Clampett. I'll be shooting at some bunnies in the backyard. And God will have some crude oil bubbling up. He's going to take care of me. I know one thing. God's word is true. He goes on to say, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. He goes on to say, God, you just help me. Uh, don't give me too much uh, that, that, that I, I'll uh, not need you and trust in you more. Don't give me too little that I'll end up cussing you and being stupid and going out stealing. Who knows what I'll do? Don't treat me like that, Lord. I don't want to be foolish because there's enough evil in the world. There's a generation of evil people all around me. He starts describing the evil that's around him. And Edgar says this, verse 15. He says, the horse leech hath two daughters, crying, give, give. He said, there's a generation, all they want is just to eat, devour, devour. And then he says, there are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things, say not, it is enough. Now, this is where we start here tonight with our list. And we're going to go through these lists real fast because of time. He gives us five lists, right? Proverbs 30 has five lists in it. And every one of them list has four things listed. And here's our first list. Five lists, four things in each one. Has four in each column. The first list are things that never have enough. Things that never have enough. Verse 16, he talks about it. He says one of them is the grave. The grave is always going to be crying for one more. Again, this is another reason for me to wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm going to live for you. Lord, I want to walk holy before you because I know, barring Jesus' return, that I too will lay in that grave. Y'all take that real serious. One day, my day will come. I better wake up this morning and recognize that grave is calling my name. Grave's never going to have enough. The second one, he says, is the barren womb. A woman who wants to have a baby and can't. A woman's always going to have that desire burning on the inside of her. I just want to have a baby. Paige, listen, this family... Bless their hearts. They don't communicate apparently with who text is who. I got a text from Brooke. I got a text from Paige. I got a text from Robbie. Then I got another text from Brooke and then another one Paige. And they're all saying, look at this baby. I got a picture of the baby today. Look at this ultrasound. They're, they're so happy. You know why? Because she was in a position where she couldn't have a baby. And when somebody gets a baby, Brooke is as happy about tater tot. But, you know, I'm mad because Brooke won't tell us if it's a boy or a girl. Paige says, she won't tell me. Five seconds later, uh, uh, Robbie Tech says, she won't tell me what it is. She won't tell me. I said, she's going to tell me. I could have made Robbie mad. If I had told Robbie I know, Robbie would have lost his mind today. <laughs> Robbie would have lost his mind. Rob- Brooke would have been getting a phone call. You told the preacher, but you didn't tell me. I can hear him now. That woman who can't have a child, and that's all. And there's been people in the room. Maybe you've never been able to have children. And there's that burning on the inside of you. It's always calling. The third thing he says is earth in a drought needs water. I just need water. The last one, number four, is fire wanting fuel to burn. We see it in California. We see it in Greece. That fire doesn't burn one acre and then stop. There's fuel. I want one more, and I want one more, and I want one more. Here's what we need to recognize. This is Augustine of Hippo. I love this quote. He says, God, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts will never be at rest until they rest in you. 
I will always be looking for more. I'll always be missing something. I need a boyfriend. I need a girlfriend. I need more money. I need a different house. I need some different clothes. I'll always be looking for something until I get a hold of God. The first list, things that never have enough. The second list, verse 19. Four things, Agar says, that I can't understand. I love Agar. Four things I just can't figure out. All right, number one, how an eagle flies. I just can't figure out how that bird stays up there in the air. I ain't figured that one out yet. Look at that big old thing. That bird is huge. How that thing stay up there? I can't figure it out. How can an eagle stay in the air? The second one is a snake without hands and feet. How can it climb the rocks of a mountain? Agar standing there scratching his head. He said he wasn't a smart fella. He ain't lying, was he? You know, came for nothing like that. Now nah, that snake get up there. I don't understand it. The third one: How can a ship stay afloat in the middle of the ocean? Look at that big old wave coming down there. We would look at these cruise ships, and you stand and say, "How can something that heavy float? That is crazy. It's huge. It's like a city." The fourth one: <laughs> How a man's supposed to live and love a woman. I, I, <laughs> Agar says, I can't figure out them women. I'll tell you that right now. I ain't figured that one out. Huh? Leave that one alone. I can't figure out women. Write that book. Agar said, I can't figure it out. I can't figure out the world around me. I can't figure some things out. Albert Einstein was not a Christian, but Albert Einstein was a genius. Listen to what he says. He says, we see a universe marvelously arranged, obeying certain laws, but we understand the laws only dimly. Our limited minds, Albert Einstein says this, our limited minds cannot grasp the mysterious force that sways the constellations in the skies. It seems to me this is the attitude of the human mind, even the greatest minds, towards God. The genius says, I can't figure out how it works. I can't figure out how the stars stay in the sky. I can't figure out how the tide comes in. I can't figure out how the sun comes up and how we can know where the sun's going to come up, how we can write a book and an almanac. I can't understand how I can put a seed in the ground and that seed does something under the ground. It comes. I can't figure it out. But y'all, Agar knew something. God is in control. The third list, verse 22, four things that are unbearable. Four things that are unbearable. Agar says, a servant who's in charge of the master. Unbearable. So that's the kid who tells the parent what to do. Ever make you curl your toes in your shoes when you see some kid mouth off and tells mom and daddy, what do you feel them toes curl up? and Ooh, it's ugly. The, the, the church member telling the pastor what to do. The employee telling the, uh, the boss what to do. The kid telling the school teacher what to do. That's the tail wagging the dog. We got that backwards. He says, that's just unbearable. Number two, I've said it this way, a full fool. A full fool. You can start reading it, verse 22. A full fool. That's a foolish man who's got his belly fed. He's got money in his pocket. He's got a car to drive. He's got a a roof over his head, house over his head, and he's a fool. He said, that's just unbearable because you know that person. Do y'all know anybody like that? He's an idiot, but he's got a little money in his pocket, food on the table. And you know what he knows? Everything. I know how to fix this country. (laughs) I know what to do about COVID. (laughs) I know what we need to do. I know the government. You don't know nothing. I was in high school with you. You barely graduated algebra. Pass algebra. You going to fix the woes of the economy? Are you kidding me? Please give me a break. Y'all know that person. They know everything. He says it's unbearable. Get, Get me away. Here they come. Here they come. You know what's wrong with America today? Let me just tell you. You can fix it. Praise God. Why haven't you run for office? I can tell you what's going on right now. What we need to do at the church is, how many years have you pastored? Will. Shut up. (laughs) It's unbearable. Number three, an evil wife. Someone who's going to keep the house in constant turmoil. Just getting something stirred up all the time. It's unbearable. Number four, a handmaiden. Heir to mistress. When a handmaiden becomes an heir to her mistress. Again, this is one of those that's kind of tricky for us. A couple of different options. Number one, you've got a maid in the house who can have children, but the mistress can't. And there's this kind of turmoil. The Septuagint, that's the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament, reads like this. A handmaid, when she hath supplanted her mistress... All right, so you have a maid in the house who instead of going to the woman of the home and asking the woman of the home, hey, how do you think we should do this? Instead, she'll circumvent him and go over to the husband and say, don't you think we need to do such and such and such and such? And the husband says, well, yeah, that's fine with me. 
And then the next week, here she comes again. And instead of asking her, her mistress, the woman of the house, she'll go to the husband and say, uh, don't you think we should do such and such and such and such? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Eventually, that right there is going to cause some trouble. That's going to be unbearable. When people try to circumvent authority and go around and do things secret and you know, I'm going to do this over here. That's going to bite you real fast. And that woman's going to knock you out with a frying pan next time you come talking to her husband about what you think we need to do in the house. That's what we need to do in the house right there. He says, Edgar ain't stupid. Edgar said, I ain't a smart man. I feel like far as gump. I ain't a smart man. But I know not to talk behind my wife's back to the mistress, to the maid of the house. He ain't stupid. Four things that are unbearable. The fourth one, four wise things. Edgar says, let me give you a list. Verse 25 is where that one starts. Here's a list of four wise things. He says, first of all, the ants. He says, I've been sitting down on the ground. I've been watching them bugs crawling around in there. Edgar says, that's just amazing. Them were some smart bugs. The Bible tells us, observe the ants, watch the ants. You go and stand over one of them ant hills. You're not going to see one of them lean back watching all the other ones work. They could. Why didn't that one just take a break and just sit there and rest for a little bit and let the other ones work? And when they're done working, he can climb on down the hole and eat the same food and live in the same hole with the rest of them. But he doesn't. That's a smart bug right there, Ager said. Then number two, he says, in the King James, it says conies. I started thinking about Sonic and hot dogs. What, what translation do y'all have other than conies? Badgers. All right, that's what rock badgers is what, what people say it is. Anybody else have a different translation? Rock badgers? I got some pictures. Y'all want to see these creatures? I said, what is a coney? A foot long at Sonic. That's what it is. I'm going to get me some tater tots and my foot long. Look at these conies here. There they are. Ain't they cute? All right. These, these are rock badgers, depending on what part of the world you live in. Hyraxes, they have other names. <laughs> Mike Barnes said, you can grill them things. He's going to eat them. Hush, Ager. All right, listen here. Uh, let, me, let me read to you real quick about these little fellas right here. You ready? These are conies in the Bible. He says, these, Ager says, these animals are something. He says, they live in families. He doesn't say this. Scientists say this. They live in families. They're very timid, defenseless creatures of the marmot or rabbit family. Because its feet are round and of a soft, pulpy, tender substance, it can't dig holes. So it's not fitted to live in burrows like the rabbit, but in the clefts of the rock. Ager says, those are little, little people. Them conies are little people, but they got good houses. Now, here they are. What a great lesson for us. I know I don't, I'm not equipped with everything. I feel like Agar now. I know I'm not equipped with everything. I know I didn't go to Bible school. I know I'm not the smartest person. I'm not the richest person. I don't have the right last name to live in Osceola. I'm not from here. I know that. But I also know that there's a place that I can run and I can hide and I can find shelter. Come on, somebody. I just feel the Holy Spirit on that. I know I don't have it all together. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Just lift your hands to it. I know my family is a mess and things going on in my house, my marriage. But I know that I can run to the cleft of the rock. I know, Lord, that I can't build a house. It'd fall if I tried. I know I'm not the best daddy. I'm not the best teacher. I'm not the best pastor. But there is a cliff that I can run to where I can find my shelter and I can meet with you. And you'll protect me and you'll watch over me. And me and my whole house will be saved. Come on, somebody. Thank God for a coney tonight. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My feet are soft. My hands are tired and feeble. I'm old and I can't do this and I can't do that. But I know how to get a hold of Jesus. <laughs> the third one he says is the locust. He says they don't have a king, but they stick together. That's smart, ain't it? He says them locusts, they swarm. They stay together. They ain't nobody up there with a flag, but there's unity. Y'all write that down. That should be us. Should be us. The locust. The fourth one is the spider. Some translations say the gecko or lizard. The spider. He says, they can make their homes in the palaces of kings. Open that door just the other day trying to take the ladder in here and a big old lizard. Here he come crawling in. I was tempted to leave him. I was tempted to leave him. And maybe we'll have revival at Osceola Church of God this Wednesday night. If that lizard crawled up the wrong leg. 
God, Nadine would be screaming. Them spiders, bless their hearts, they can get into, the, they're just an old bug, just an old lizard, but they can live in a palace. Hagar said, that's pretty smart. The last list tonight, we'll finish Proverbs chapter 30, right here with this last list. The last one are four creatures that move in amazing ways. Hagar said, I just watch them and I'm amazed by these creatures. It starts in verse 30. Here's the list. The first one is the lion. Oh, the lion. It's just amazing watching the lion move. And that one's not hard for us to understand. When we go to the zoo and stuff, you know, we want to stand there and look at the lion. And we'll go to wild adventures and I'll try to get them to growl. I'll make noises at them and the boys will stand there and look. We, we love lions. They're ferocious, majestic beasts. The second one is the greyhound. And some Bible scholars say it should have been a horse. Either way, what was yours? What's yours say? Roosters. I've read rooster. I've read horse. I've read um, greyhound. Anybody else got a third one or a fourth one? Who? Well, we're, get, we're getting to that one next. Greyhound and horse, most Bible scholars say it's going to be one of those two because of the sheer speed that Agar stood by and watched the speed of these horses, the speed of these dogs. Statesville, North Carolina, the, the mascot was the greyhound. Fast, fast. And Paul looks at Christians and he says, we're supposed to be like racers running the race, pressing towards the mark. The third one, the third one, Agar says, is the goat. We went from the lion to the goat. He said, let me tell you about another animal that's just amazing to watch, the goat. All right. The greatest of all time. Here's a billy goat, not the billy goat. Right. He's not talking about the billy goat that stands in the backyard and chews on cans. Now, they're talking about mountain goats. Um, mountain goats, the one particular that they believe he's talking about is called an ibex. I'm going to show you about one minute and 30 seconds of a video just to show you. Now, Ager, all 3,000 years ago, however long it was, he stands there going, look at them billy goats. We're making TV shows about it. All right? I want you to watch this little video clip real quick. There's no sound. We'll mute the sound. Just lose the sound, Bradley. This is in Italy, and they've made a show about it. People are sitting at home paying the Discovery Channel to watch about these goats. Look at their goats right there. This is a dam in Italy where these goats climb on the side of this dam. Huge dam, massive dam, and they walk on it like it's nothing. And they'll go up. There's a little baby. They'll go up there, and they'll lick the rock because this rock gives out this salt that the, that the animals need and they want in their body. And they'll walk on it. Look how tall that is. Look at the one crawling across the top. Discovery Channel, Animal Planet have done TV shows about the goat. I don't think Edgar was that stupid. We're still amazed by him. Now, how'd that thing do that right there? Look at that thing right there. Honey, come here. Honey, come in here. Look at this goat in here on the television. Look at this thing here. I mean, that's amazing. There he is licking the salt off. It's absolutely amazing to see this animal, no fear. I'd be petrified, terrified with the opposable, th opposable thumbs climbing. And look, they don't think anything of it. Their hoofed feet... And the kind of the pat padded sticky feet made them able to just walk and to go and to climb. And Agar stands back and says, it's amazing. And this is the thing, the word of the Lord for us. Again, maybe my hands aren't made to dig. But God has equipped every single one of us to climb whatever mountain that's in front of me. I may not be nothing but a goat, but bless God, when his hand rests upon me, he'll take me where he wants me to. I am well able. Whatever you face at your job tomorrow, maybe I couldn't make it through it. But God has given you all the tools you need to climb that mountain. Maybe what's going on in your marriage, I could have never survived it. But God has equipped you. He said, I never lie more on you. I believe that. And I know people had different interpretations and ideas of what that means. But I believe with all my heart, you will never never face a situation that God has not equipped you with the power of the Holy Spirit to come through and to go over in Jesus' name. The last one was the king without war. He says, it's just amazing to watch a king. He's gone from a goat now to the king. To stand back and watch a king who's not being opposed. To watch a king. I'm going to close with this quote. This is from Harry Ironside. He was a great evangelist, amazing preacher, amazing minister uh, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, he ended up past, uh, pastoring at Moody Church for a while. He actually preached Billy Sunday's funeral before he died in the 50s. This is what he says about this king, and we'll close with this. He said, how pleasant is the king going forth in undisputed majestic strength. Now he looks at you. And he says, it is the overcomer, the man of faith, made a king unto God. 
His dignity is never greater than when he walks in lowliness and meekness through this world. Drawing his supplies from above, not from below. Great is the honor conferred on all who have been redeemed. No longer children of the night, but of the day. They are called to overcome the world in the power of the truth revealed to them by faith. They are the kings of the king. That's us. That's us. That if we'll walk in great humility, holding on to the word that God is giving us. You guys, we're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. I'm a king, y'all. Somebody said, I'm a king. I'm a queen. I'm a daughter of the child. The chi- I'm a child of God. I'm the daughter of the king. I'm the son of the king. Come on, let's just pray right now tonight. Father, we, we go with our heads bowed low before you, but our head lifted high before our enemies. We walk with our chest out and our shoulders back, recognizing, Lord, that you have made us to be royal priesthood, that we are priest and we're royalty, and we walk before you, God, recognizing from whom cometh our help we walk humbly before men but we walk boldly into the presence of Jehovah God we come to you Abba Father willing to receive your discipline willing to receive your correction now so that we can rule and reign with you forevermore I'm willing now to be a son that you would come and you would speak to me and you would correct me that I would grow and become a king Oh, Father, tonight we ask that your word would stir in us and stay with us all week long. We pray, Lord, that tomorrow at work, tomorrow at school for our kids, that you would come and manifest your presence to us. That tonight in our bed, tonight as we open this book, we read from this book, Lord, let there be a holy, ecstatic vision that comes to our hearts. That you would reveal yourself to us, that we would see you in ways that we've never seen you before. We would hear you speak to us this week in ways that we've never heard you speak to us before, that in every mountain and every valley that lay ahead of us, that, God, you would equip us to do exactly what you've called us to do. Make us the men you've called us to be. Make us the women you've called us to be, the husbands, the wives, the fathers, the sons, the brothers, the sisters. God, make us who you've called us to be. And for that reason, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' name. Hey, this Sunday, I'm going to ask you if you could come and be here. We're going to start taking family photographs out here in the lobby this Sunday. On our church's website, you can go to oscillacog.com right now and you can look at it. There's a tab up at the top right-hand corner where you'll be able to click. And we're going to have an online directory. All right, you'll have to have a password. We'll give passwords to active members so you can go online and you can submit what information you want to submit. If you say, I'll put my phone number, but I don't want to put my address, that's fine. But what we want, used to we had those little books that were directories, which were wonderful. They cost money to make the websites free. All right, well, we pay something, but you know what I'm saying. We're going to have uh, Miss Belinda, I think, is going to try to be here on Sunday and start taking photos. It'll probably take us a few weeks, and then we'll upload those photos onto the church website. That way, if you say, oh, I need to call so-and-so, or, or now what's that person's name? I can see their face, but I don't know their name. You, you can go on that website, and our, our Osilla COG type in that password we give you, and you'll be able to see other church members and see their faces and be able to pray for them and not talk about them. What's that woman? What's her name now? You know who I'm talking about. The one that sits on the front row. Her clothes are real bright and colorful. I had to wear sunglasses when I say, what's her name now? What's her name? Linda Griffin! Come on down! All right. So you can... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to get myself... She's got it going on! All the single ladies. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. If you're a single man out there, Linda Griffin, sitting on the front row of the Church of God, come on down. <laughs> All right. So this Sunday, uh, wear, what are, wear your Sunday best, and uh, we'll put you on the online directory. There's other things coming up we'll share with you soon. Visit us outside in the lobby. Uh, we're starting tonight selling T-shirts for the Alaska missions trip. All the pro- It's a good-looking shirt. Um, uh, those pro- pre-ordering now to send our team to Alaska. There's a table sitting up here that the women's ministry is doing heading up uh, for the Alaska team. We're actually taking gifts with us to Alaska to give to the women there. The men are doing the same. I think the men are doing a wallet and a, a gift card. And then the ladies are going to have like a bag and some other little goodies. And can we contribute to that? Can we give money to that? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, give me some money. Mama said, yeah, I'll take 
All right, so if you're going to do that, write Alaska on the offering envelope. If you want to give towards those gifts for these ladies and these men, pray for them. And, um, and that's just coming up next month. We're sending them to Alaska. So we love you. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday morning. It's going to be good.